Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday Bible class to the theme, what it, what it Was Like at the End of an Age. And, of course, we thank our brother Craig Farron for his two studies that he gave us, uh, The Best from the West. And um, he did it online and did a, it was a very good class, two very good classes, so we enjoyed those. And, and tonight... Of course, our brother Trevor Crispin is to continue on with the first of his two nights on Malachi chapter 3 and 4, and uh, we look forward to his comments in a moment. We're going to firstly open our class with hymn number 101, and uh, as you've probably worked out, we're going to have a recorded hymn. So hymn 101. Let us then bow our heads in prayer to our Heavenly Father. Loving Father, we thank thee that we are able to approach unto thee and have been given multiple blessings, a measure of health and strength so that we are able to gather here, and many physical and also spiritual blessings from thee and from thy word. We thank thee that we are able to gather here in a quiet place, away from the noise and fear of the, in the world around us, to instead focus on thee and to talk often one to another of the hope which we have in your name. We pray for those who are unwell and unable to be with us. Pray that thou will give them a blessing. For we know there are many that would love to be here but are unable to because of ill health. Pray for thy blessing upon them and upon all those who are thy people. We pray thou bless the words of our speaker, our brother Trevor, that he may be able to clearly present the message of the messenger, Malachi, whose words were spoken so long ago and yet whose, and whose words yet speak to us and echo down to us through the centuries so that we at the end of the days, end of, the, end of, eight, of all the ages, await the messenger of the covenant. We pray also for, a, for forgiveness of our sins and look forward to the day when we may offer a pure offering. For thou art a great king, O God, and your name shall be known throughout all nations. And so we seek thee through our Lord and our Master, even Jesus the Christ. Amen. <clears throat> and so our brother Trevor is to speak to us upon the topic, what it was, the theme rather, what it was like at the end of an age and the topic for tonight is the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple and as an introduction to that, that presentation we're going to read together from Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. And he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord, as in the days of old, as in former years. And I will come near, near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away an alien, because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, 
In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that they may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for, for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts, and all nations will call you blessed. For you, ye, you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord, yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said it is useless to serve God, what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the proud blessed. For those who do wickedness are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. Then those that feared the Lord spake one to another and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make, make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then, shall, then you shall again discern between righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. So thanks, Brother Trevor. We're very much looking forward to your com comments on the topic, the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Thanks, Brother David, and good evening, brethren and sisters, and those watching in through the live streaming. Uh, we come to the third chapter of Malachi, and as uh, David outlined, um, you know, we've had uh, two great studies um, on the first and second chapters, and the, the book of Malachi is somewhat of a challenge. There's a lot of negativity in the book, and uh, in some ways I feel privileged to have the, the last two chapters, which you know, have some more positive messages in them. Um, but Craig has done a, a great job setting the, uh, the background and the scene for us, and we'll move into, into chapter three, with a, uh, a bit of a summary of some of the, the key perspectives between God's view and man's view. So we've, uh, we've covered off chapters 1 and 2. And we've got, um, I have loved you, and the response to God is, where have you loved us? You know, wherein have you loved us? The priests have despised God's name, and they responded, where have we despised thy name? You have offered polluted bread. Wherein have we polluted thee? Yahweh will not accept your offering. Well, why won't you accept our offerings? What's wrong with them? You have wearied Yahweh. Wherein have we wearied him? And then in this chapter tonight, return to me. And they say, wherein shall we return? Verse 8, you have robbed me. Wherein have we robbed thee? And your words are stout against me. What have we spoken against you? And you can see straight away by that summary, you see uh, the response of the people to Malachi's words is, is the complete opposite to, to how you think people would respond. And the problem that uh, Malachi was facing is that the people had very limited knowledge of God's word. And, and because they had limited knowledge of God's word, they didn't really know him. And because they didn't know him, they didn't know how to respond to him. They didn't know how to worship him. They didn't know what God was requiring, and so they couldn't tell that they were falling short of what God had required them. And so they constantly battle against Malachi when, uh, when God speaks through him, and they, they keep rejecting the, the, um, the message that, that Malachi is giving to them. So you could describe them as, as spiritually blind, and uh, there's two reasons for that. Uh, first of all, the, the priests weren't doing their job. The, the, uh, it was the role of the priest. The priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should 
impart that knowledge to the people. And the flip side of that is the people made no effort themselves to find out about God. They weren't interested in pursuing uh, God's ways and God's word. Uh, and, um, and so they're left in a situation where they're, they're ignorant of God's word, they're ignorant of what God wants of them, and when God, um, through Malachi, tells them what he wants and tells them what's wrong, you know, they're ignorant to even respond. They're ignorant, they won't even respond. And the, the worldly cares had uh, in, engulfed them and they were, they were just void of spiritual understanding. And so we end up with a, a group of people that um, uh, are carelessly indifferent to God. And they uh, end up leading to apostasy. Um, they married wives outside of the truth and they led them astray. And they became so lacking in spiritual um, understanding and development that they vigorously defended their attitudes towards God. Now, verse 1 really uh, jumps into the scene following on from uh, the last verse in chapter 2, verse 17. And I think uh, Craig uh, alluded to that, so left that for me to, to deal with. Um, but the, uh, the very last part of, of, of chapter 2, verse 17 the people respond and said, look, we hear what you're saying, Malachi, but you know, where is the God of judgment? Or where is the God of justice? And verse 1 responds, Behold, I send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith Yahweh of armies. And this final message of the book of Malachi starts in, uh, in verse 17 of the previous chapter. It really shows how the people felt about God. They were, they were really ignorant. Um, you know, they'd wearied God and they said, oh, how have we wearied you? And in the end, they, um, they make judgment upon God's character himself. And you say, well, I hear all these things, Malachi, but... Now, where is this God of judgment? They question God's moral character, in, in a sense. And later in this chapter, we see um, this attack on God's moral character again. Now, God isn't a God of judgment. He, he, he doesn't make decisions. He doesn't interfere. He doesn't um, get involved in our affairs. He, he doesn't put things right. Things just go on as they are. And so God's not really involved so they really show uh, a complete um, ignorance of who God is and who, uh, you know, the character of God and his, his judgments. Well, the Bible describes um, our God as a God who wants a relationship with us. And all through these, uh, these ac accusations or these accusals and denials, we find that the, uh, the, the people just aren't listening to God and they're not interested in a relationship with God. But the, the Bible talks to us about God in, in the sense that he is interested in having a relationship with us. God is looking for people that respond to him. They didn't know that God was trying to manifest himself through them or to show his glory um, and fulfil the covenants through the people that he was revealing himself to. So God, God's got these covenants, these beautiful covenants that he's made. He's got a, um, a loving um, and merciful character and he's seeking people to, to share that divine character with, to, to share that, uh, those attributes and to respond to him in like manner. So we, we know that we're created in God's image and we are indeed his image bearers. So we have the, the moral capability to understand God's ways and we can respond to God. And God wants to dwell with us. God wants to live with us and he wants to have a relationship with us. But first of all, we have to respond to him. We have to listen, we have to understand, and we have to respond. And God is like a... You look at the aspects and the attributes that God uses to describe himself. 
Um, he, he wants a loving relationship. He describes himself as uh, the relationship of a father with a child. And in Malachi, we talk about you know, a master with a servant, and that can be uh, a loving and, and fruitful relationship. God describes himself as a friend, one that shares the same thoughts and moments and intents and feelings of the heart. And God uses the, uh, the idea of um, a marriage to describe how he wants this relationship to be with him. And in a marriage, in a, in a relationship that you have, when you have moments, and it can be with a close friend, but, uh, but it can be with a, a close loved one, when you have moments where you feel and think exactly the same thing at the same time, you're enjoying the same experience and you feel and think the same thing at the same time. And it could be something like um, you know, some really highlights in, in life. It could be um, a marriage and then you have two joined together, husband and wife, uh, in deep love and you know, excited to be wed together. And then it could extend to the, the birth of a child and the, the excitement of those special events, the excitement of the expectations of what's coming, the excitement of the good things that can come from a moment in time, a shared moment in time between a husband and a wife that are thinking and feeling exactly the same thing at exactly the same time, and they're responding to each other. And God says, I'd like our relationship to be like that. I've described it as a marriage. And when we look through Malachi, we do see some themes regarding relationships. As I said, I'm a father and you're my son. I'm a master and I'm a lord and I'm your God. And I'm a God of the covenant. I have loved you, Jacob, and yet you've despised my love. And my promises are my covenants from the priests right through to the people. The covenants and the love of God was rejected. And they even got to the point where they said yeah, that it was tiresome for them, for them to worship God. And in a sense, they were basically saying to God, I don't really want this relationship. And you're offering a relationship to me. You, you, you say, you know, I'm a father, where's my honour? You know, I want to be a father to you. And they said, well, we're really not interested, God. And it was a sorry, sorry state. And not only that, but the, the covenant relationships that God asked them to be involved in uh, and through the, uh, the covenants of marriage, they treated with disrespect. And the covenant of marriage was to, a direct, to be a direct reflection on the model of the relationship that God had with his people. And so they not only despised the relationship with God, they, they despised the covenants and they put away their wives that they had taken in their youth and the wives that had, um, they'd made a covenant with, that covenant, uh, which was the acknowledgement of two becoming one, joined together for life, and that's what God wants of us, two to be joined together, for us to be joined with, together with Christ and with God. And they just stopped working at their relationships, all the relationships, they just stopped working at them. They just gave up. The covenant I've made with my wife, well, I'm going to give up on that. I'll put away my wife. The relationship I've got with God, well, it's just a weariness. I'm just, not, I'm just not interested. I don't get anything out of it. They were so full of, of self-will and self-desire. And that's not the sort of relationship that God was looking for. Because, you know, when a, a couple find each other, um, you know, when a, a, a couple first... Um, experience a, a relationship. I mean, it could be um, a close friend and that, that develops further and it, um, it blossoms and, and it, it um, turns into love and, and it turns into a, the building of a relationship in marriage. Or it could be um, a, a romance that blossoms quickly and it's, you know, it's like um, love at first sight. And whilst I don't believe that uh, to be a, a real thing, there's certainly uh, chemistry that can happen. And you can say, well, love at first sight, but it's got to develop. It can't be that superficial level. It's got to develop. So it could be a romance that blossoms quickly. 
or it could be a, um, a relationship that develops over time and over years it deepens. But after you are married and you begin to share life's experiences, share time together, the, uh, the value of that relationship becomes deeper and deeper by those shared experiences. What we find is you, you become bound closer together. You know, the relationship becomes more solid by those experiences that you share together. Husbands and wives, their life together, their shared experiences, uh, bind them together on the, the journey through life. And it really is the same with our God. We have shared experiences in life with our God. And we believe his angels are working with us and working in our lives and that their hand is involved in many of the experiences of life. And so we grow through them and we develop our characters as a result of them and we grow closer to God through those shared experiences. And that's a beautiful thing, the way that God has, has embraced us and called us. And yet the generation that Malachi is talking to have given up on that relationship and they've, uh, they've forsaken everything and they've gone after other things, other more enticing things. And you can see from the questions and the answers that they had drifted away, drifted away from God altogether and they had lost their love for him. And so they really didn't know who Yahweh, the God of the covenant, was. They, di they didn't know him and they rejected the words of Malachi and we come to these words, Behold, I send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight in. And we've got, um, we've, we've got a, a question here. You know, who, are these, who are these people? Um, the verse part, you know, Behold, I will. And then my messenger... Prepare the way before me and the Lord uh, and the messenger of the covenant. And we've got, I guess, multiple applications of who these people are. We've got um, God who declares himself, and at the end of that verse we see it, uh, Seth, the Lord of hosts. So the Lord of hosts is the, the I and the me through this. And the, the messenger um, begins with Malachi, but there's uh, a number of applications. We have Malachi, and these verses, I think, be uh, belong uh, to um, an application to Nehemiah, who came to the temple and purged and cleansed the temple and threw out all the stuff of Tobiah, the Ammonite, and purified the priests in uh, Nehemiah 13. But we, we know for a certain, of a certainty that it applies to um, the um, work of John the Baptist in preparing the work for Jesus, when he came suddenly to the temple and overthrew the, the tables of the money changers. And we know from the latter verses of this, uh, of, of this book uh, that applies to uh, Elijah and the second coming of Christ, when Christ shall suddenly come to the spiritual temple of believers and he will purge the, the priesthood once and for all and set up a house of prayer for all nations. So we, we know that it applies to John the Baptist because Mark and the other Gospels Quote um, directly from this chapter. Uh, this is the beginning of the gospel of Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Malachi, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before me. Jumping then straight into um, Isaiah 40, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John did baptise in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for mission of sin. And so there's a God of judgment coming, Malachi says, and we jump into the fulfilment of this prophecy and we say, here's John the Baptist. And, uh, and look at the message that he, that, he, um, that he quotes straight from Isaiah 40. Uh, and we'll... Um, Uh, we'll uh, read the first few verses. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith the Lord your God. 
the voice of him crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for your God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and every hill shall be made low. The crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And really, uh, we'll come back to the second part, and we'll deal a little bit more with, uh, with Isaiah a little bit later on. But here's this message of judgment. And um, Malachi says, Who will abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. Well, Malachi says you, you, you ask for judgment. You don't think that God is just. You don't think that God takes any notice of you. Well, here comes the judgment. You're looking for a judge. You're looking for fire and for wrath and for purging and for treading down. And you, you think I'm an austere God. Well, just wait until the Lord of armies comes with his mighty angels and brings judgment to you. And John the Baptist came, didn't he, with the power and spirit of Elijah. And you, he called you to repent. Repent of your ways and humble yourself. Every mountain should be made low and every valley lifted up. Everyone on one level to receive the judgment of God. And, and what were the words of John the Baptist like? John said to the multitude that came to him to be baptised, and particularly the certain classes that came to him, O ye generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the tree. Every tree therefore thereof which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So a generation of vipers, you know, who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come. You know, this is, this is Malachi, you know, there's a, a time of judgment coming. And John says, and the root of the tree is going to be cut down. The tree will, will cut, cut, be cut down, hewn down. It's not bringing forth any fruit. This is the judgment that you, you're asking for, surely. The words of judgment and justice. Exactly what you've asked for. The, the, uh, the, the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. And in the middle of these proclamations of judgment and a call to repentance comes Jesus. And Jesus comes onto the scene. And John describes him as the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world. And Isaiah says, A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax he shall not quench. He shall bring forth judgment and truth. And so you've got these warnings of judgment and of justice, and, and John the Baptist sets the scene, and then behold, the Lamb of God that comes to take away the sins of the world. Isaiah 42, verse 1 Behold my servant, whom I uphold. Mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall put, bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. And the idea behind these words is, is, is justice. There will be finally justice from my servant, in whom I delight. And you, you pick that, that, uh, that link back to verse 1 of Malachi 3. The Lord in whom you delight. Now, in some ways it was somewhat of an ironical claim that they delighted to see the Lord. Um, and when he came, they rejected him. They didn't know who he was, didn't know that he was the beloved, and they rejected him. But God hath delight in him. John twelve forty six says, I am the light that's come into the world, and whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. In verse 46 of John 12 and if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. 
So the, the message that Malachi has got is, you, know, you think you're looking for a God of judgment. You think that God delights in judgment and that he delights in punishment and anger and wrath. Well, you don't know who God is at all. This is not what God wants. God gave Israel a bill of divorcement, but it wasn't what he wanted. The Lord hates divorce. So God will exercise judgment and justice on the people that reject him and turn away from him, but it's not what God wants. The, uh, the words of Isaiah 42, I think, really paint a, uh, a beautiful picture of, um, of what God does want and how God looks at, looks at us. He shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. The quote I mentioned before, a bruised reed shall he not break and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment and truth. So Jesus came and he wasn't going to break the bruised reed. He wasn't going to quench the smoking flax. For he will not fail nor be discouraged till he hath set judgment in the earth and the isle shall wait for his laws. Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, he that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth, that which cometh out of it, he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, the spirit of him that walketh therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thy hand. And I will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light to the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. This is what God's all about. God's not about judgment and justice and condemnation. God's about righteousness and truth, about holding the hand, about opening the eyes of the blind. And, and through the message of Malachi, God wanted to open the eyes of, of his people. He wanted to set the, fris, the, the prisoners free from prison. And to those that sat in darkness, he wanted to break them free out of the prison house. And God does not want to, to, God does not want to judge us. Jesus does not want to condemn us. But we know God will not be mocked. He has done everything he can to bring salvation. And absolutely everything he's done for us to save us. But he will purge the earth of wickedness. And he will do that so that his glory can fill the earth. And that he can perfectly manifest himself through his creation, which he created for his good pleasure. And in that sense, he delights in the, the end goal, you might say. He delights in the, um, the, the, the vision of the earth being filled with the glory. And he knows that judgment will come and the wicked shall be removed. Romans 8 tells us in verse 31, For what shall we say then of these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. And that's what God wants to do. He doesn't want to condemn us. He wants to justify us, but we have to work with God. And who is it that condemns us? Is it Christ that died? And yea, rather that is risen again, who is ever on the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? And the whole purpose of Jesus' sacrifice was to bring salvation. Jesus died on the crucifix that, we should, that he should come again not to condemn us. And he could have condemned us without dying. But that wasn't the plan. That wasn't the goal. He died upon the cross so that he might save us, not that he might condemn us. Now, I, I 
I must, must say, I'm not planning on getting through all the verses tonight, just in case you were wondering we're going a little, little slow. Um, I am uh, taking a bit of licence. Um, the section from verse 16 through to the end of this chapter, which is very exhortational, um, I've decided without consultation to uh, cover that in an exhortation coming up in a couple of weeks. So um, we'll, we'll cover those verses very, very quickly. Um, But, yeah, just so you know, we're not trying to cover all the verses tonight. Uh, so who shall abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appears? For he is like refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And I'm going to cover uh, the fuller's soap uh, briefly just first off. Um, and here you've got a, a, a picture of, um, of fuller's. And as I understand it, this was a, a name of a... Uh, of a job or an occupation, and it has to do with uh, the root word has to do with stamping out or stepping. And you've got a picture of men um, in uh, in baths, and they're they're stamping out the cloth, um, and they're, they're using fuller soap. And um, it was used in the process um, of making making wool. Fulling is a step in the woolen cloth making process. It involves the cleansing of cloth to eliminate oils and dirts. Uh, the result is that the wool is pure and white. The cloth also undergoes, undergoes bleaching and wetting and beating of the fibres. And the fuller soap contains an alkaline substance to remove the oil. Uh, with the cloth soaked in soap and water, the fuller would beat and stomp and stamp out the impurities by walking on them. Um, so I just thought I'd throw that in because I wasn't really sure myself of what full of soap was, but uh, that was the explanation I, um, I came up with. It's unlike ordinary soap, it's got those alkaline substances to, to pull out the, uh, the oils and impurities. So we're jumping back and forth a little bit. Um, who may abide by the day who's coming and who shall stand? And then we'll get on to the refiner's fire because he picks that up in the, the next verse also. Now, who shall abide in the day of his coming? And the question is, who shall abide and who shall stand? And the word stand has to be, you know, who will be upright in that day of judgment? And the ones that are going to abide and the ones that are going to stand uh, are the people that recognise the true message that God has delivered to us. And they've become true messengers themselves. If we live a godly life, then we become the messengers of God. Because people could see in us the message. They can, they can see in our lives, the way we act, the way we behave, our moral principles, they can see the message, the message of a life of Christ and a reflection of God. And if we share the good news of the kingdom and the good news of Christ, then we're true messengers. And these people that abide and these people that stand are those who have shown in their lives now the characteristics of Jesus Christ. And they will be the true priests of the coming age and the people from whose mouths the word of Yahweh will come forth. They are the ones that will abide. Now, there's a couple of allusions that I, I, um, I liked and um, Daniel is one of my favourite characters in the Bible and we've got in, this, um, in these few verses the picture of the resurrection process and a description of the care and the love and the kindness of the angel as, uh, as we see Daniel symbolically raised from the dust. And so we read, um, I heard the voice of his words and I was on a deep sleep with my face toward the ground, a symbol symbology of, of death. And behold, the hand touched me and set me upon my knees that first stage of resurrection, of awakening again. And he said to me, O Daniel, O man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto you and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken these words unto me, I stood trembling. So there was some strength given to Daniel. And Daniel's a man that will abide. Daniel's a man who will stand, who will literally be upright. Because that's what it's saying, both in terms of the resurrection but in terms of his character. And then he said unto me, Fear not, Daniel, 
Daniel was trembling. He says, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou hast set your heart to understand and to chasten thyself, I'm not sure how that, that red didn't come up too well, um, and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. So try and just keep those two uh, phrases in the back of your mind. Um, to have chastened thyself and I have come for your words. Jesus says in Luke 21, at the end of uh, his prophecy, Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And Ephesians, when you've taken on the whole armour and when you've done all to stand. And in Revelation, we have this beautiful picture of the saints around Christ, around his throne. And after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. That's us, brethren and sisters, God, God willing. And they stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, as it were, purged with full of soap, with palms in their hand. This is our calling, brethren and sisters, in that day to stand and that day to stand in the presence of Christ and to stand with him and to be stand with all the saints of all ages and to dwell in the presence of God and to have fellowship with him and to have fellowship with Christ and to have fellowship with each other clothed in the white robes of immortality because this is what God wants. He wants a relationship with us and he wants it to last forever. And so Malachi says this doesn't happen without refining. And in one sense we've talked about the, the fierce refining of those that have turned their back upon God. Um, but there's a refining process that goes on in our lives as, all, as well. Uh, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier and shall purge the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may make an offering unto the Lord in righteousness. So... Um, two applications there and in verse 4 then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as it was in the days of old well the, the fire of judgement comes upon those that do not judge themselves we've got a, a little picture there of the, the refining process uh, a, a fierce heat um, Peter says to us that now that you have obeyed the truth and have purified your souls, and you think back of the words of Daniel, he uh, purged himself, he purified himself, to love the brotherhood, brothers sincerely, who must love one another intensely with a pure heart. John 3, beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when, we shall, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And Daniel was encouraged, and, and, uh, and the words to Daniel were that he purged himself and purified himself. So the people in Malachi's day did not, understanding, did not have an understanding of a loving father chastening his children. And through, the lives, um, through their lives, he refines them. And through their lives, he burns away the chaff and he removes the impurities and the dross. And the, the refiner is constantly aware of the process that's going on. It's not like you, um, you, you put the metal in an oven and walk away. The refiner is constantly observing the silver and removing the dross, constantly reviewing what's happening with the gold and removing the dross. And, uh, and so it is with our Father, with the angels that work on his behalf. They're constantly watching us, and they're applying heat, and it burns away some dross, and, and they're careful not to, to, uh, to overheat and to spoil the process. They don't give more heat than what we can withstand. But God is, is using the events and circumstances in our life with the heat that's applied to, um, to purify us, 
And God refines us and we purify ourselves. And we're working together, aren't we? There's that unity of God working with us, God applying the heat as a father who chastens his children, and we purifying ourselves and, pure, and, and purging ourselves. And as that word describes in Daniel, he purged himself. And God is working with us and we're, we're working with God and we go through the trials of life and God develops our character that we might be more like him. And you, you see the situation in Malachi's day. Um, they were blaming God for everything that happened to them. They didn't see him as a father chastening them at all. Um, they'd, uh, they'd forgotten the exhortation. I mean, we know this. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. And that's exactly what they'd done. When, when things got tough, they rejected God. They lost heart. Because the Lord disciplines those who he loves and punishes those he accepts as sons. First of Peter says, Brethren, know that, the, know that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So this refining process was, is, was, uh, was being applied to Israel. God was putting and making things difficult for them so that they might, uh, they might appreciate that God was trying to work with them in their lives. But they saw God as a, a, a refining fire um, and they saw that there was no uh, benefit in the process whatsoever. They didn't see that, uh, that God was doing this out of love. Um, they challenged God on, on every opportunity, at every opportunity. And so in that, uh, in that true sense, um, when they rejected, um, when, when uh, the times of Christ came and the attitudes of the people were you know, the same as, uh, as Malachi's day, nothing had changed. There was a time of, um, of uh, a fierce trial. And um, the, uh, the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. They said they were looking for the Lord, but they really weren't looking for him. And when he came, came, when he came, they despised him and rejected him and they called upon a curse upon their own nation. And the armies of the Romans came against Jerusalem and there was a violent refining and a purging of that nation. And the doors of the temple were shut for good. But there is a day, as Malachi says in verse 4, um, where the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem shall be pleasant as they were in former years. And I guess we, we, we reflect back upon the times of, of, uh, of David and of Solomon and a few other occasions where the sacrifice and the offerings were pleasant to God in the former years. And um, Malachi warns them that this refining process um, will come upon the nation and it will come upon the sons of Levi. And when the process is finished, um, then the offerings will be pleasant to Yahweh again. And we can see two elements here. First of all, the fulfilment in, nat in, uh, in natural Israel when, uh, when Christ returns and the, um, uh, the, uh, the responsibilities of, um, of the, the priests and the Levites will be reinstated. But there's another group of those who, uh, those who are spiritual Israelites um, and they'll be involved in the work of the purifying of, uh, of the nation of Israel and the purifying of the tribes of Israel and they'll uh, at least assist in that work. Ezekiel talks about that time when Jerusalem is re-established and the worship and temple worship is re-established and that the, the priesthood is there again and the, the Levites are attending to their duties. And in that day, the, the offerings will be and the sacrifices will be, uh, will be acceptable to God and they'll be offered with an understanding, a true understanding of what those, uh, what those sacrifices mean and the, the spiritual, spiritual significance as they look back and, and, um, and point to the sacrifice of Christ. Uh, we, might, uh, we might skip...
skip over that one, get to verse 3. And we, the, the next section we're going to do with quite quickly because it's... Um, and, and this section we'll basically skip straight over. But it's a, a, a call to... Um, uh, call to confront them um, exactly what's going on. And he lists down all these, uh, these points. He accuses them. Um, and they come straight out of the law. Uh, and they come straight from Leviticus 19. Um, and Leviticus 19 begins with, I am the Lord. I, the Lord your God, am holy. And you should be holy too. You should be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Uh, and I will be a swift witness against you. So Leviticus says, Judgment against the sorcerers, the adulterers, the false swearers, those that oppress the hiring in his, wa- in his wages, oppress the widows and the fatherless that turn aside the stranger and that fear me not. And this is exactly, you know, almost word for word, what was happening in Malachi's day. And, um, and uh, Malachi lists them straight out of, uh, out of Leviticus. And these are the characteristics that God doesn't want to see and he'll purge them out completely from those to live a life which is complete opposite to God's character. And then he jumps into this uh, section for I am the Lord. I change not, therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. So I'm a refining fire. Um, I will purge out the dross. But because I'm Yahweh and I change not, you won't be consumed. And we, our minds go straight back to the burning bush when God revealed his name to, to, uh, to Moses and the covenants that he put in place. And it was a symbol of Israel, the burning bush was a symbol of Israel not being consumed. And despite the fact of generation after generation turning their backs on God, God's purpose would still yet be fulfilled. And so Malachi would say to the people, You have despised me, Um, but I will still raise up a generation that that will be faithful and reserve a generation to the very end. And we know that the covenants of promise guarantee that position. Um, Jeremiah says, if I can break the covenant of day or the covenant of night, um, then my covenant will be broken with David, my servant. So he's saying, you can't break the covenant of day and night. You can't break the covenant with David. Paul says, is God's people cast away, which he foreknew? Uh, And he talks about Elijah, who made intercession against his people. And, uh, And God says, Okay, Elijah, but I've got 7,000 people that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. I've got a remnant. And in verse 5, even so then, also in this present time, a remnant according to election of grace has come into being. So no matter matter what happens during the purging process, there will be a remnant. And there'll be a remnant of Israel and there'll be a remnant of the saints. Paul says, blindness in part hath happened to Israel that the uh, that the Gentiles might come in. But there will be a day where all Israel will be saved, when the deliverer shall turn them away from ungodliness. For this is my covenant unto them, then shall I take away their sins. So because of the covenant, the sure mercies of David, the promises to Abraham, God will take away their sins. And Malachi says... It's the same old story. This, is, this has been the case from the days of your fathers. You've turned away from my ordinances, those listed in Leviticus. But he says, return to me, the message straight from God, return to me, and I will return to you, saith the Lord of hosts. And they said, wherein shall we return? Well, when we look at Malachi's message, and particularly when we get through these next few verses that we'll, we'll skip over quickly about you know, robbing God, when we look at Malachi's message, we start to think to ourselves, well, it's a bit of a worry because you know, even though we're looking at Malachi's time and we've seen you know, the, the extent to which they ran to wickedness, there's elements in there that I'm just not comfortable with. Um, and I can, see that, I can see what Malachi's getting at, 
I can hear Malachi's words in my ears and late at night when I'm laying in bed, I think to myself, well, there's some message in Malachi's words to me as well. And you think, you know, am I selfish? I can be selfish and self-centred. You know, do, do I make vows? Do I make promises? And, and I don't you know, make commitments and I don't see them through? I do do that. And I know there's times when the pressures of life are all around me and um, I, I, I know that I could do better. And I say to myself, I've done the best I can, but I know I could do better. Or I could have given more, or I could have walked further, or I could have waited longer. And we know that God is watching all of this and God's not fooled. God, God knows us better than we know ourselves. And we're very good at fooling ourselves. And yet Malachi's message is, return unto me and I will return unto you. And that message, it's, it's for, for all of us. It's a message that Malachi delivered, but a message to us as well. And it's a message that's come from the beginning of time, from the times of Adam and Eve. And you look at Adam and Eve's sin, when God had to, to, uh, to step in and cover their nakedness. Um, you know, they sinned and they, they, they hid themselves from God and they, they covered themselves with their own coverings, their own making. And they heard God walking in the cool of the day and they hid themselves. You know, I think this was actually the highlight of the day. This moment in time, Adam and Eve were working in the garden and, uh, and it came a point in time, at the end of the day, they would finished their work and the cool of the day it was time for them to relax and to rest. And I had this picture of... Um, of the angel coming and, and talking with them and talking about the things they'd done in the day and, and the angel would, would, uh, would ask them questions and the angel would give them answers and they'd ask the angel questions and there was this, um, this open discussion and this open fellowship and, and this unity between Adam and Eve and the angel of God. And there was a, a fellowship in simplicity and, innocent, and the innocence and yet this day, God called for them and they were hiding. They, they, they covered themselves and they, they hid from God. And God comes to have fellowship with them. And he calls out, where are you? And they declare they'd sin and they'd hid themselves. And God says, return to me and I'll return to you. Confess your inadequacies and your failings and come out and return to me and I'll provide you coverings and garments to redeem you and to restore that position of, of fellowship and to restore that position of walking with me. And this is what God has done through Christ. He's called us to return to him that he might return to us and have fellowship with us. And this is the, the earnest plea the, the expression of a God who's not exhausted with grace and truth and mercy. And yet they respond, what do you mean return? What do you mean return? What do you, what do you, what do you want, God? You want me to return? I'm, not, I'm here. I'm not doing anything wrong. They didn't understand that, uh, that beauty of that grace and that peace that we can have with God. And chapter 3, verse 8 and 9, they rob God, and we, we get, fall back into the same pattern. Will a man rob God? And you say, you've, you, you've, you've robbed me. Well, how, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Well, you, you, you curse with a curse. You've robbed me, even the whole nation, and you don't know. And God says, look, I want to work with you. Return to me, and I'll... I'll Bring me the tithes and I'll, I'll you know, put me to the test. I'll bless you. The heavens will be opened and I'll pour out my blessings on you and there'll be, there won't be room enough for it. And I'll rebuke the devourer. I'll rebuke, rebuke the, uh, the locusts and the, the canker worm that's destroying your crops. I'm bringing these trials on so you'll come back to me, so you return. Return to me and I'll, I'll give you blessings. I'll take away these, these cursings from you. And the vine will cast forth, the vine won't cast... Um, to the, be cast to the ground before it's time. And all nations will call you blessed. Yeah, this is what I want. I want everyone to see you as a blessed nation, as a nation that's, 
that's uh, reveling in the goodness of God. And we, we know that time will come. And if we jump down right even to the, the last parts of this uh, chapter in Zechariah, Thus saith the Lord, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold of, the, and of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. And this is what God wanted the nation to be, to be an example and a, um, a banner that he could fly and say, Here's my nation, Israel. And the nations will come, we know. God will fulfill his, fulfill his purpose. But this generation... This generation just wouldn't respond. And, and so they spoke stout words, arrogant words, against the Lord. Yeah, what have we spoken so much against you? you know, what we're saying is fair. You know, this, this is a, you, you've given us a pretty hard lot, God, and we're, we're putting a, a fair case to you. And God says, you're arrogant. You've spoken against me. And you've even said it's vain to serve God. Well, what profit is it that we should keep his ordinances, that we have walked mournfully before the Lord our host? And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, that tempt God are uh, even delivered. Well, isn't, isn't that, you know, that's arrogance, isn't it? That's arrogance. That's a slap in the face of God. You know, you call the proud happy. God hates the proud. They call him happy. You know, those that work wickedness. Well, you're setting them up, God. And those that tempt you. Those that actually go out of their way to disobey God and to tempt him and say, ah, you got to do anything about this, God? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm living a wicked life. But no, you're not there. You're not there. And there's people saying, oh, now God's looking favourably on that. They had no comprehension of who God was. And, you know, and these verses aren't couched in the, the, uh, the experience of, well, I'll, I'll put more money in the collection and then um, next week I'll have you know, $10 more in my, um, uh, in my pay packet. You know, God doesn't work like that. He's not saying you know, the blessings are a direct relationship. Um, though God did say he would, he would promise blessings on Israel that they might be a banner for him. But uh, you know, God works with us and he gives blessings in other ways. Um, but they, uh, they worship God um, and, uh, and they, uh, they worshipped him according to their own way. Um, James says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God, cho God chosen the poor in this world, rich in faith? And that's the, the true riches of the heirs of those of the kingdom. Well, this is how they came to worship God, and we and could we say it's worship in any way? You know, they were arrogant, they were boastful, they were proud. They put themselves first. Um, and they're saying we keep all the ordinances, um, but yeah, they really knew that that was a lie. Um, they offered the lame. Uh, they didn't pay their tithes. Um, but anyway, you know, we weren't getting anything in return, so. Um, God just has to be happy with that. And they, they walked around mournfully, verse 14. They walked around mournfully and miserably and their heads were hung down, almost, to be, almost ashamed of being associated with the God of Israel. And they were mocked by their neighbours. You don't still believe that rubbish, do you? You don't believe that God exists? Surely that's old-fashioned, old beliefs. Now, God doesn't work in, in, in the nation's and, uh, and you hide your faith under the uh, light of a bushel. And there's no honour to God at all. And they challenge God's righteousness again and again. Isaiah, and then I'm going to conclude with this, Isaiah picks up this, um, this idea of you know, you know, what, what does true worship, worship look like? You know, they, they saw it as a burden they didn't see, they got no reward from worshipping God. And uh, Isaiah says, is it, God says to Isaiah, is it such a fast that I have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? 
Is it to bow down his head as a bull rush? And that's exactly what they were doing. They were walking around with their heads down mournfully to spread sackcloth and ashes under him. Will thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? And you know, that's not what God wants. That's not how our worship should be. Our worship should be joyful. And we should, we should uh, feel privileged at the, the experience of God's grace. And as I goes on, I don't want you to be mournful in your worship. Is it not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness? This is true worship, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the ties of the oppressed and they are oppressing the fatherless and the widows, to release into freedom those who are broken and that you break every yoke. Is not true worship? to share your bread with the hungry, that you bring the poor and that are cast out into your house, when you see the naked, that you cover him, and that you hide not yourself from your brother. Isn't this true worship? Then shall the light break forth as the morning, and thy health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall gather thee. Then shalt thou call, and thou shalt hear the Lord. And thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here am I. And thou wilt take away from the midst of the the yoke, and putting forth the finger, the spreading of vanity. Look how God responds to us, and look how God wants us to respond to him. I don't want you to mourn, I want you to rejoice. I've called you to salvation. I've called you to be my sons and my daughters. And when you call, verse 9, when thou call, when you call and when you cry to me, I will return to you. It's, like, it's almost like a child who runs, who runs around in a, in a paddock and, oh, where, where's dad? Where's dad? And he cries out to his father. And Paul tells us that the spirit of Christ is that we cry out to our Father, we cry out, Abba. And so we cry out to God when we return to him, Dad. And he says, here am I. I've been here all along. I just want you to to return to me. And I'll be here for you. And I'll hear you and I'll be happy to have fellowship with you. And I'll be happy to spend time with you and to walk with you and to be refreshed and to walk in the cool of the day, hand in hand. And Malachi turns to a group of people and he sees the remnant. And they that feared Yahweh spake often one to another and hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared Yahweh and that thought upon his name. Well, thank you. Thank you, Brother Trevor. Uh, a lot of thank you for a lot of research and effort that you've put into that, and the, thank you also for the enthusiasm you've tried to display and um, convey to us. And I've, if I may, I've summarised a few points. Uh, he, uh, our Brother Trevor opened with the fact that the people were spiritually blind and they didn't know what God wanted. I thought that was an extremely good explanation and were therefore carelessly indifferent and, and, and defensive in their words against the prophet. Uh, if we want God to help us with our problems, we need to have God in our lives and a relationship with him. Uh, they were giving up on their relationships and, and obviously with God as well. 
Malachi's words were seen in the fulfilment of the terms messenger and messenger of the covenant in Malachi himself and in the coming of Nehemiah in a short time in those days and also seen in John the Baptist as the forerunner of our Lord Jesus Christ and of course in the future as Elijah as the forerunner of the King of Kings. God didn't want judgment, he wanted to save his people and he wants to save us but he won't deny himself. We become messengers of the message and will stand and abide in that day by that action. To abide and stand in the day of the messenger of the covenant, everyone needs to be refined and purified. Uh, that refining is a constant process and indicates that God is at work, though it's difficult to handle at times. God does not change. That is, he does not change his promises and his covenant. And there will be a remnant. A day is coming when we will return, all of us, both those in Malachi's day, and see the difference between those who have served God and those who haven't. And God wanted to bless them and wants to bless us. And so our brother Trevor finished with the, the picture of true worship to the glory of God. So thanks, Brother Trevor. And so the, these are the announcements, God willing, and uh, of course uh, of events that will take place, God willing. And of course next week we look forward to our brother Trevor again to continue his study on Malachi on to chapter 4, I presume. Um, yes, um, Saturday... Uh, there's, I have no announcements for Saturday as such, unless anyone else has anything they want to add. But uh, Sunday, uh, there's Sunday school at 9.15am and uh, it's going to be a catch-up after the holidays and, uh, and some revision ready for the exams on September the 3rd. So that's coming up quick. So that's Sunday school at 9.15am. The exhortation at 10.45 is to be given here by Brother Jason Farron. Uh, that's a change to the schedule. Uh, and at 6pm we have our Bible education evening by our brother Adrian Farron to the topic, the Lord's Prayer, often recited, rarely understood. And of course, as we have nearly every week, we've got at 8 p.m. Bible Spotlight on the uh, Coast FM. Loving Heavenly Father, though we change and grow old, yet you change not. And therefore, we look to thee, we hope in thee, we trust in thee, and we wait for thee, O Father. As we have considered together all the promises from ancient times which are promised to be fulfilled and will become a reality soon in our eyes. We pray for thy blessing as we go from this place and indeed, Father, wherever we go, we pray, we pray you will go with us to guide us, protect us and preserve us, each one of us, that we might be a part of thy heavenly kingdom. That though we go through trials, we may become like he might become like gold and silver in thy sight. In the name of our Lord and Master, we seek thy face and give thee praise and approach thee in thankfulness. Amen.